So this is Alternative Comics Festival's Animations Creative Minds with John Mastentono. So John Mastentono is a queer cartoonist and writer living in Chicago. John is a veteran organizer of Chicago Alternative Comics Expo, also known as CAKE, and a practitioner and teacher of Vipassana meditation. <laughs> So, John, would you like to start off, um, maybe introduce yourself a little more and just present your screen? Sure. Thank you, Eliana. That's nice. It's Vipassana meditation, um, but close. And you got my last name right, which is very rare. So thank you for that. Um, I'm John. Like Eliana said, I, I help organize a show called Cake in Chicago. That's a comics expo. Um, I'm happy to be with you today, and this presentation will be about alternative comics and animation. And first, I'll talk about what I mean by alternative comics and what do I mean by alternative comics festivals. And then I will talk about how an episode of animated television show is written and produced. And then after that, I'll spotlight a few different artists who have worked in alternative comics and then later been successful in animation and look at their evolution as artists. And hopefully that'll be inspiring or encouraging to you because it's inspiring and encouraging to me. And then we'll conclude and there will be time to ask questions. So the genesis of this, this panel, this talk is that I know a lot of people who went to school for animation and they didn't like it and they make comics instead now. And then I also know a lot of people where it's the reverse. They went to, they make comics and then they ended up working in animation and like good jobs in animation. So I wanted to look examples of the later thing and share that with you. And you're here at Shy Team Lit Fest and maybe you're interested in comics or zines or cartoons, but my general idea is to let you know that there are these resources in this community available to anyone who wants to participate in it and also hopefully demystify some of the elements of making comics or animation. And because this is a lit fest, I'm guessing you're more interested in aspects of animation that involve writing or storytelling. So I'll be focusing on that specifically because it, you know, it takes hundreds of people to make a broadcast ready season of a cartoon, but where it applies, I'll touch on jobs that are more purely drawing or voice acting or like management but writing's like the key to everything I'll be talking about. So what I mean by alternative comics, and I'll share my screen now. Can you see my screen? Not yet, it might just be loading. No. Oh, now we can Good. see. Great. So what I mean by alternative comics are personal work, like things like these, self-published, made with love, homemade in most cases. Um, and usually one person will write and draw everything in a book uh, and maybe even staple or bind it themselves. I, I staple my comics that I make and I trim the edges of the pages and just like made with love for a few hundred people, uh, sometimes a little more than that, sometimes less than that. And some people will even use just like a home printer, just the printer in their house to make these. And there's maybe like a thousand people in the United States make this kind of thing. And I get an overview of that because like we said, I work on a comic show called Cake uh, and that show's curated and people apply to it. Um, and I look at all the applications and it's, it's a very creative community, but it's relatively small, at least here in the Midwest. And um, a good number of people who make work like this will also table at zine fests and also comics shows. Um, and the difference between an alternative comic like this and a zine um, is pretty nebulous and it's kind of up to the artist what they want to call it or what tradition they feel like they're working in, what inspires them. And the distinction between a zine like these and a comic like these, it's very important to some people and not at all important to other people. So I'll try to be respectful of that, but 
at least in the Midwest and the communities that I know that it's a pretty significant overlap between the two things. Um, and what I mean when I say to table at an expo, uh, and we'll look at examples of different comics festivals and a zine festival is to have a table like this, like this picture, you see the people on the right side of the picture are selling work to the people on the left side of the picture. You have a table that has your comics, books, looks like postcards, stickers, uh, t-shirts. And this is at a show called SPX in Bethesda, Maryland, and people apply to this show and go and sell what they have. But you know, these are these are for the most part very homemade, small print run things. And I'll one another note about like vocabulary. I'll try to say expo when I'm talking about a festival like this one, and I'll try to say show when I'm talking about a television show. But I always say show for festivals, and I I think I have actually already messed this up. So I'm sorry if that's confusing. I think I said show when I meant expo earlier. Um, but there's a circuit of these throughout North America where people have a table and, and showcase their art and their books. And some of these shows are SPX is one we've been looking at here. There's another one called TCAF in Toronto, which is a huge show. These are some posters for the show that I think are, you know, incredible, just beautiful. And this is in a research library in Toronto. Uh, this is the ground floor of the library, but then also all the way around the second floor of the library, there are tables uh, with people. And there's a giant room to the right of this slide as well. That's just people with their books, selling their stuff, meeting um, people interested in comics. And yeah, it's great. And it's a huge, huge show. I mean, thousands and thousands of people. And here in Chicago in May typically will be Zine Fest, which uh, one of the organizers of Chicago Teen Lit Fest is someone who works on Zine Fest. And that's one of the reasons I was interested in being involved because like, I know that that person understands this community and like the energy of it and how vital and creative it can be. Um, so yeah, like I said, some people who make comics are at these shows and other people make zines. Uh, or there's comics with words, but not pictures, or pictures, but not words. It might not be a comic, but here's a show called Cake that typically will happen in June. And of course, all these were either virtual or canceled this year, but um, Cake is the show that I live on. It shows up panels and workshops, like the one we're at now, just like this, just like this lit does. And in 2012, I just went to Cake as like a fan of comics, but my friend who makes comics asked me to help him with his table. So I just made a little like eight page zine and just printed a few of them to trade with people because there were other comics artists I liked who were gonna be there. So I just figured, well, I'll just make something stupid and maybe they'll trade with me and I, I get something good for it. And they did. And it's eight years later and I just kind of never stopped doing that and making more elaborate books, you know? And now I help run that show that I just kind of wandered into. And my comics have been on like best of lists and nominated for awards. And I've helped people publish successful books and I've gotten to do art workshops at Facebook and career counseling for School of the Art Institute. And I've been to all these shows, I've been to Toronto and Maryland and St. Louis and Columbus a bunch of times and it's just like it's a miracle and all that happened just from that one show. So we'll talk about a bunch of people in animation who did the same thing and then oh, one thing I want to say too like um, doing this kind of sitting at a table and having the public go up to you it's different than posting work on the internet for probably a lot of obvious reasons, but it really polishes you to what an audience is interested in from what you write or what you draw or both, like what people respond to. And you can see that. 
um, to have that immediate reaction is like just a way to find your own voice and to have a community of peers who are also looking for that. I, I think it's so exciting and vital and, uh, and yeah, and, and open to anyone, open to absolutely anyone. Anyone can make a comic or a zine and walk around cake and try to trade with people, you know? Um, so there's this whole community right there and it, it might be different than what you think of when you think of comics like X-Men or Batman when the animation that we'll talk about, these are comics artists, just some more work like to kind of zoom in on the kind of books and the kind of work that is being sold at, at these shows by the artists. Yeah, and these expos might be expos might be different than what you think of as C2E2 or San Diego Comic Con, um, which is not necessarily a focus on comics, but like film or TV or or actors. But a lot of what I'm going to say, you know, you could it's kind of a parallel community that you could map onto C2E2 or those other shows if mainstream stuff is more of your interest. And there's a lot of overlap too. But like one thing I was thinking was that there's more interest than ever. There are more outlets than ever and more interest from like streaming services and cable TV and broadcast TV. There's more places looking for animation than there have ever been. You know, like ever in history, like Adult Swim and Netflix and HBO Max and Cartoon Network and they, they have room for creative voices and, and some of these weird creative quirky shows have been really successful for them and there's like space for it. So this person is called Pendleton Ward and he tabled at these same shows. He tabled at TCAF and SPX and by 2009 he was at San Diego Comic Con doing a panel for his show Adventure Time which he had just sold to Cartoon Network. Um, if you don't know Adventure Time, it's a show that was about a boy and a talking dog and they were in a post-apocalyptic world. And it became this gateway for a lot of people in alternative comics to find careers in animation. Uh, and it was popular. And uh, so I'll be referring to that one pretty frequently just because it's sort of closer to my own experience and I know some of the people I'll be talking about specifically for that one. So he made, when he was at San Diego Comic-Con, like this is a sample of something he made, this Bueno the Bear. This is, you know, a folded half piece of paper with the edges trimmed by Pendleton Ward. And this is pretty um, representative of the zines he was making at the time when he sold this cartoon. Um, I mean, I, I'll just read it real quick. It's Bueno the Bear in an interactive conversation by Pendleton Ward. Hmm? Hey, put her there, pal. Put her there. Grab it and shake it. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, now that we're friends, I need to ask you a favor. Will you do it? Will you promise? If you promise, then sign your name here. In your blood. Rad, now that I trust you, I'm gonna spill my guts. Blech. Gobble, gobble. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> eh, but seriously, I need a favor. Will you hug this gun for me? Just tear off that piece and bury it, or crumple it up and throw it on the ground. Hurry, and you can tear off the gun and hide it <laughs> for the bear. Uh, oh my goodness, thank you, Sai. Now let me do you a favor. Here's 20 bucks. Sai, I'm gonna miss you when we're done hanging out. Maybe I should try to appreciate the time we have left together. Marry me. Wait, wait, here, hurry, jam that ring on. Do I take you to have and hold till death do us part? I do, do. And then, and find another bear.com. So like, if you're familiar with Adventure Time, there's none of the uh, aesthetic, like earmarks of it. It's just like strong writing and most importantly, like very strong, clear visual storytelling. I can tell who the bear is talking to and what the action is. And uh, 
I have some sense of the environment from the little grass here, from the church you're laying on the grass. And it's good. I mean, but it's so simple. So I show you this because in a minute we'll look at an animatic for an episode of Adventure Time that the same artist drew. And you'll see that something like very simple can turn into something very sophisticated with just like not that many steps. So this is from a Daily Beast article from 2017 uh, where they talked about how Adventure Time is made. And it says that it takes about nine months to produce a whole episode. And they have four people in a writer's room at this stage of the show. And those four writers generate a two page outline of what's gonna happen in that episode. And then they hand that over to storyboard teams who have two weeks to visually outline the episode. And we'll look at storyboards next. But they're basically directing, says Osborne. They're writing all the jokes, editing the outline, picking all the camera shots, what the episode is going to look like. And some shows are made like this, where um, the artists figure out what's going to happen or figure out a lot of the details. And some are driven by a very full script. Um, and there, you know, both ways are good and you can make comics both ways too. So if you think of yourself as purely a writer and like bad at drawing, like I did, I thought of myself just for years that way, but you know, things can happen when you add pictures to your words, uh, it can help you edit. It can help you show instead of tell. It can ground setting. It can fill out the space where something's taking place with detail and layer and nuance and help you build a fictional world that's fuller and more developed. And you might find that satisfying and you're at the exploring. And I know if you draw every day, you'll get better. Like that's a fact and better can mean a lot of different things. But so here's a storyboard example um, from Adventure Time. This is by an artist called Laura Metzger. And you can see what's happening here. And then we'll jump ahead. You've got three boxes here, dialogue, action, and timing. Timing and animation refers to how long an action takes. So this person was given like a bare bones two page outline of the episode. And then they're just gonna draw the action and write the dialogue and time it out. And we, we jumped ahead to from page three to page 300 here, but you can see these objects moving. You can get a sense of what the show is going to look like. And point being, Adventure Time hired a lot of people from comics to do these storyboards. They had a storyboard test, which we'll look at a sample of that in a couple of minutes. But here's an example of that same artist comics work. And you can see there's like a little bit of shading and, and tone because it's, it's more of the finished piece, but it's like clearly the same person, you know? And this, this is the cover of that book. It was called Sea Urchin. I think it was a pretty popular book and a good book, but like, this is a more personal story, you know, clearly. Uh, yeah, so a storyboard team is then gonna go back to the people running the show and kind of refine that. And then there's another team to refine the art in the storyboard, but um, then they record the voices based on that, you know, just based on these, they record the voices. And then there's like layout design and background design and color design that they're all gonna send to the studio to, to animate, um, to kind of fill out the world. But like here is, and animatic. So the next stage after they do the voices and everything, they just take the storyboard and they put in really limited animation. So this is from the third episode of Adventure Time. And this, these drawings are by the guy who made the comic about the bear. Like, <laughs> And like not long after, probably right around the same time. And you can see like, you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, like this is the whole, <laughs> this, 
you know, not the, there's most of the choices about what's significant in this work are like right here. That's the main thing I wanted to show you, like, because I, I find this incredible. I'll jump ahead to like some of the, I think one of the characters has, has captured some princesses. But yeah, like all of, yeah, there's not even a background on that one. And of course the character designs would be like, the animators would have more detailed information about the character designs from other people. But yeah, that's just, that's what an animatic is. And then they send that and all the other collateral design stuff, just like to Korea, Korea sends it back and then they do little edits and that's, that's it. That's all there is to it. So my phone rang, I'm sorry about that. So now like, in that spirit, I wanted to show you the evolution of some artists and maybe you'll find it inspiring or, or interesting. So these are all artists who tabled at comic shows, who, you know, went through that same process of showing their work and having a table and preparing things. Uh, Rebecca Sugar was the creator of Steven Universe, is the creator of Steven Universe. And kind of the reason, another reason I was interested in doing this talk is when I went to SPX in 2018, she was a special guest at that show and she had a, a line like around the entire ballroom and all the way down the hall. And she had come to the, that same show as a teenager. Like when she would, she grew up, she went to high school like right by Small Press Expo, SPX in Maryland, and had a table there as a teenager and showed her work. And she was returning as this like conquering hero with a line of people dressed up like her characters. And it was amazing. And people were so excited. And she was almost like too big and too famous, but she had this personal loyalty to come back and do this show. And that just made me want to know more about their career and their evolution. Um, cause I mean, her work wasn't necessarily familiar to me, but yeah. So this is an example of work that she was making as a teenager. This is one of her zine comics, like very early on. And then she went to school for animation at SBA. And this video is an example of a loop that she made in school. So. I mean, schoolwork, just very simple movement that's on a loop. Um, it's key to the actual like nuts and bolts part of animating, but I just, I thought it was cute. I thought it was nice to see something rough like that. Okay, and then in 2010, uh, a publisher called Buenaventura Press, which was just this one guy, published her comic, Pug Davis. And this is, I think, while she was still in school or like right after she got out. You can see an example of what her comics look like here. And then at some point, she took some variation of this storyboard test. And this is one for Adventure Time. And it just has, you can find this on the internet, but it's here too. It's just a paragraph and it says, do a 20 storyboard page storyboard of this paragraph. And, uh, you know, it, it says, feel free to change any of these details to express the depth of your being. And that's, she took that and she did well. And she got hired onto Adventure Time in 2010 and worked there for three years and left to create Steven Universe in 2013. And I mean, this is just kind of right out of school. And this video shows you very early examples of the work on Steven Universe, like how she developed those characters. And
and maybe you can see some through line between my comics work and some of the work in the sketchbooks here. You know, and to make a show that ends up looking like like this, I mean, it's beautiful. And again, the framework is all the framework is all there. The framework is all the fundamentals that you learned from school, number one, but also being in a creative community that was challenging to her and having to um, be face to face with an audience and figure out what they want and you know what what her own voice was and what are her, her unique vision and. Yeah, I mean, I haven't watched this show, but this is a popular show, right? I mean, people love it. And as I was researching her also, like she wrote a lot of songs when she was working on Adventure Time. And I, someone told me you get paid more if you write a song, but I think it's cool that she makes music as well. And it's good to diversify your interests like that. And comics are very multidisciplinary too, because you, you have to write and draw and, color I mean, you know, animation can be that way too. Um, we'll, we'll see someone else who makes music later. The next person I want to talk about is John Pham. This is a picture of a comic that he made called JNK. And he was born in Saigon. And in 2000, in the year 2000, he got a grant for a comic called Epoxy, which is the one on the left here. And then this work is a little, not very long after, maybe like 2005-ish. Um, but the grant he got is the guy who, one of the people who created the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles had a grant called the Xeric Grant. Uh, his name is Kevin Eastman. And that, those people too, like I, in, I guess it was 2017, I went to Columbus to a show called Space that had been going for like 25 years, 30 years or something. Uh, and I went there to sell my comics and talk to people. And one guy there bought something from every single person because he had gone to the same show when the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles guys had the first like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles zine that they made. That was the first appearance anyone had ever seen of these characters that are cultural icons. So he goes back every year and he buys every single thing, <laughs> which is kind of amazing. But, um, but I mean, you know, this, these shows, these little shows that get maybe 200 exhibitors, 300 exhibitors, and maybe four or 5,000 people come through the door. Like they, they have had an effect on the cultural landscape on, on pop culture, for sure. So yeah, so Kevin Eastman gave back to the community by giving this grant and he gave John Pham a little bit of money to publish this comic on the left. And you can see that there's a little more variation in the one on the right, it's a few years later. And this is more recent work. It looks like in 2010, John Pham moved to Los Angeles and he worked as a designer on a show called Problem Solvers for Cartoon Network. Um, and then there were other, ADHD was something that Fox did to try to compete with Adult Swim, which was another network that was showing like quirky animation. Um, and John Pham was the art director of all those shows. Um, and an art director, what I mean by that, like they can do a lot of things, but they're basically responsible for establishing a design or a layout for other people to draw and execute. And then he's kind of like the boss of the artist and he's approving art and managing people and workflow. And this is like, this is a zine he made of video game ads that I really like. Um, you can see printing is an interest of his. Um, but clear storytelling, like I can tell these characters apart. I can tell you what's happening without reading the words. Um, and I, I personally just like his work and I think his evolution as a comics artist is exciting. So, I mean, here's 
this was just like a web short that he art directed. And it's it's not it's not exactly the same, but there's a kind of energy to it that maybe has some DNA in common with the comic stuff that we saw. Or at least the presentation is like exciting, like key. Yeah. Anyway. So these are some shows he was an art director on. Okay, KO, let's be heroes is something that a number of these people work on now. Um, the next person I wanted to talk about is Ben Jones. And again, he tabled at comic shows. He graduated in 1999 from MassArt with a like a studio BFA, just an undergrad degree. And then in 2003, he was one of the co-founders of an art collective called Paper Rad, which you know kind of reprocessed like 90s internet stuff and like hand drawn and bright colors and, and slippery copyright, you know, Garfield here. Um, but this was like very, very popular and it was particularly popular in art galleries, but it was also just popular, popular, like this got a really wide following. So here's an example of some of his like gallery work. But this guy, Ben Jones, by like 2007, he was working on a pilot for Adult Swim and the network passed on that, but then they, it, like four years later, they rebranded it as a show called Problem Solvers on Cartoon Network. So not for adults, but a kid's show. And that ran for one season. Um, and these are an example of some of his publications. Like this is a comic here. And this is a comic that he did around this time. It's a character that has a, I think a duck for a hat and a dog for a body and then a dog for boots. It's kind of good. It says 2002, but I think it's way later. So this is, these are the kind of comics he made and the kind of zines he made. Um, and then after he worked on problem solvers, he got hired on that same block of ADHD on Fox that I was talking about with John Pham. And he was um, the creative director of that, which is a job. I talked about John Pham being an art director. A creative director is like a step above that. And it's the person responsible for approving or like reviewing all the aspects of a project. And they're kind of responsible for like the philosophy or the soul or the vision of the show, like Don Draper on Mad Men, he was the creative director of the places where he worked. And this is one of the, this was like his show on that block on Fox. It was called um, Stone Quackers. But my point in looking at this guy was that it seemed like he just made art that was amusing him, that was almost like trolling at this very small scale, you know? And it was maybe kind of primitive seeming, but then Paper Rad became very, very famous. And then like, and then none of the shows he created were really hits. Like Problem Solvers was canceled after one season and that block of animation on Fox was shuttered. And then he, um, after that, went to go work for the studio that makes Bob's Burgers actually, which is also at Fox, but I guess it just seems like he's very cr true to his creativity and to his vision. And, oh, and Neo Yokio is one of his recent credits of something he worked on. And like none of the, you know, it, it seems like that creativity and that vision just keeps getting rewarded by better and better gigs. And I think that's cool. I think that's really cool. And the next person is Lisa Hanawalt, um, who was one person who actually came to Cake. Like the overlap of the timeline is enough that she was here in Chicago at least twice that I remember. Um, but she grew up in Palo Alto, California, and moved to New York. But in high school in the late 90s, 
she met this guy, Raphael Bob Waxberg, and they made a web comic called Tip Me Over and Pour Me Out, which is what we're looking at here. These are pages from that web comic. Um, and then years later, that same guy sold a show called Bojack Horseman to Netflix, uh, which is this cartoon about an ex-actor and his roommate and they're depressed. And that show was very popular and ran for four seasons. And she was the production designer, like the original production designer on it. So yeah, here's some of her comics work. This is 2009 on the left and I think 2012 on the right. These are some covers. And oh, one thing I wanted to say, um, here's examples of comics or zines that seem driven by drawing, you know, like not, probably didn't write a script for the dog wearing a fax for a hat. But probably made a silly drum and then made a caption for it. And, you know, we'll see some other work of hers that feels more driven by written ideas. And just, yeah, here we go. Like, this is a review of a movie. And then this is more of a, um, you know, more of what you would think of as a standard, like, comic with panels that tells a little story about a horse that makes these like fingers as art. And her friend has come over to watch a movie. And then here she is like, she's wondering about these fingers that she makes. But, you know, if you think of yourself as purely a writer, you might just try doodling like this and get a sketchbook and see what comes out. Because if you expand that, if you expand those ideas, like, Good things can happen and it's good to try to do both you might be surprised um so she was lisa was a production designer on bojack horseman with this friend that she met in high school uh these are character designs from bojack horseman but a production designer can mean a lot of things too but <laughs> Essentially, it means character design and costumes and the color palette and the designs of the locations and the kind of the details that fill out the world. So we looked at we looked at an animatic that was like the bare bones of the story, but she was doing more of this creative role of production designer. And it's a lot of work up front on a show as you're starting it, but it sounds fun to develop a world like that. And then this is a music video that she made that someone else animated that I think you can see like just a very highly developed aesthetic and a very refined style. And such a cool color palette. You know, and, you, and this is an example of someone who just started making a comic with someone else in high school and putting it on the internet. And they just, she just followed that rabbit hole and kept making stuff. And 10 years later, they have a show on Netflix together. And then a little bit after that, she leaves Bojack Horseman and she's a showrunner on her own show. She's in charge of this other show called Tuca and Birdie. Um, which is just even more her aesthetic. And she'll run her job, I mean, probably is self-explanatory, but it would be the producer in charge of making all the decisions. So the main person in charge, the person running the show, like literally. Yeah, and this was on Netflix for one season and then Adult Swim uh, picked it up after Netflix didn't want more of it. This is a trailer for the show. But yeah, I mean, clearly the same person who you could have wandered up to in 2009 and bought this off, you know? She just knew what she liked to do and she kind of went for it. And I think it's awesome. I hope it's, I hope this is exciting to you because I like looking at this stuff. Here's another person, it's Tom Herpish, and he also went to SVA. Um, 
which is the school that Rebecca Sugar went to, but he graduated much earlier in 2002. And he tabled at all these comic shows and zine shows too. And these are examples of his comics, self-published. Um, his comics are usually like just very emotional and combine like DMD monsters and like dungeons with almost like art therapy. Uh, and they have a little bit of a, a philosophical or a spiritual angle to them too, but they're just like very emotionally honest and sincere first and foremost. And I, both those things are really important. Like even the really slick stuff we've looked at today has to have some essential emotional honesty to it. And even Ben Jones, who's sort of like trolling, there's something about that work that's real, that's lived experience. And that's why I include this guy. It's just like pure heart. And it's it's hard to convey in PowerPoint slides. It's hard to convey without reading it. But, you know, he's telling me stories about dungeons that feel like it lived experience, even though they're about like wizards and monsters and stuff. Um, yeah, he's really good. He worked on Adventure Time from 2009 to 2017. It said he designed some characters and he was a storyboard artist. And then he went over to Steven Universe after that. And he also worked on a show called Over the Garden Wall. He was a storyboard artist there. And it says writer. He has a writer credit and a story credit for that. Um, and I mean, these are his storyboard pages, which look kind of different from this, but they're clear, you know, like the, the thing that's important about these are the part of the step that hundreds of people um, who are going to make this finished cartoon, the things that are important about it are, are here. Um, yeah. So I hope that's, I hope you can see that. And then he works on a show called Summer Camp Island now. So he's like still in comics. And he, or sorry, still in animation and hasn't done a comic in quite a while. Um, both he and the next person work on Summer Camp Island. And their their styles are really different, as you can see. But you know, that's good. It's good to work with people who are different than you. So this guy, Jesse Moynihan. This is the last spotlight I'm going to do, and then I have some notes at the end, and then we'll have time for questions. He grew up in Philadelphia. He went to Pratt Institute for one year and dropped out. And then he went back to school later. He went to Temple University to earn a film degree. And then he decided to focus on making comics after he graduated. But in 2005, he got that same Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles um grant it's called a grant it's called a zero grant i don't know if i said that before he got that same grant um and he produced this comic from that uh backwards folding mirror so this is 2005 and then by 2011 he's making this um clearly the same guy but i mean this is called forming and it's a web comic that he's still doing i looked and he had upside it, he had updated it this week so it's been going for for nine years he's been putting up pages of this and it's a sort of a again like a philosophical or spiritual story um and he also worked on adventure time like 2010 was the first animation credit he had. And he was a storyboard artist on that based on, so if that's 2010, it was like right, you know, it was somewhere between here and here, but closer to here. Um, but he worked hard. And this is a, this was a web series that he made with his brother. So someone else animated it, but he, He's credited as the writer and the director and co-creator. Is that too violent? I'm sorry if it's too violent. Yeah, but I mean, I've met this, I've talked to this guy at Comics Expos 
at length you know he's just a person he's a nice guy who worked hard and and he was lucky enough to table at shows where he could see what people liked from him and continue to like follow his personal vision and uh and when i say he found his voice it's like i don't i don't mean that figuratively like look at the, i mean i know the sound isn't on but like Clearly, there was a process from here to here <laughs> that is a person like being their best selves, being their best selves are just like, I don't even know what you would call it, but I, I mean it very literally, like he found something here. <laughs> he works on a show now called Midnight Gospel, as he's credited as a writer and a storyboard artist. And I just, I include him just because I love the way he draws. And seeing his evolution, I think is like, it just makes me feel good to look at this. I think it's beautiful. And it's not that the earlier work is bad. Like I have all those books too, and I like them. It's just, uh, yeah, it's almost unbelievable to me. So that's the last person that I wanted to talk about. And I guess I can stop sharing my screen, come back to see you. Hi. So like I said, like the networks have had all the success with these quirky shows and like they're looking for unique voices. And some of the examples that we've seen from 10 years ago and summer from last year, but the conditions that are that made that are still the same. Like it's the same soil, like nothing has changed. Even though the, the festivals are shut down, the community is still extremely active. Um, and even though it's COVID times, like animation is one thing you can still do. You can produce it without being in a physical space together as a like polished, finished thing. And you can't, you can't do that necessarily with actors without getting shut down constantly because one of the camera people got a positive COVID test or whatever it might be. But it, and like, there's other steps of live action stuff that have to be done in person. Um, and also like if you're trapped in your house all winter anyway because of COVID, like trading zines through the mail and like looking into this community, it doesn't sound so bad at all. Like it's fun. And I also want to say that like probably, so we looked at those big pictures of like hundreds of people at, at a festival, right? And like maybe 10% of the people who have a table at that festival don't have another job outside of comics. Like most of them have another job outside of making comics but, or zines. But like people do it because they love it. And because, and it can lead to a lot of other careers. Like I do print design in an office, but it's like graphics, you know, it's not that different from the comics I make. And a lot of people I know teach comics or teach art. Um, you can do storyboards for live action, like commercials. Like I know a bunch of people who make comics who do that. That's another direction. But hopefully it's like all flowing together and inspiring and influencing everything else. Um, not just work life, but your personal life too. Like so much in my social circle is people I know from comics and comic shows. Um, so if this is interesting to you. I just recommend like read as much as you can and maybe go to Quimby's and Wicker Park or just look at alternative comics hashtags to find work that speaks to you because there's this great variety and like there's so many people making so many different kinds of work. Even just the six artists I talked about today, like they were all over the place. Like they were making very different kinds of stuff and maybe you'll discover something that's exciting to you. And Chicago Public Library has all kinds of like art comics from bigger names in the field and like Fanographics and Drawn and Quarterly and Koyama Press. And, and the people I talked about, like you could DM some of those people and ask them for advice, but my point isn't necessarily to do that or to follow these specific people, but to find inspiration in whatever creative communities are interesting to you and consider looking to alternative comics festivals to find encouragement and find inspiration. 
And if you share stuff with people, you'll learn how to communicate your ideas more effectively, like share stuff with your peers or share stuff with people at a comic show like that or an art fair and learn how to tell stories in your own way and tell your own stories. And, and again, like find your voice, find your style uh, or continue to find it, you know, continue to hone it. And it's really important to learn how to work with other people creatively, like no matter what you end up doing, whether it's whatever it is. Like we saw an example of people who met in high school making a Netflix show together. And we saw this guy, Penn Ward, giving so many cartoonists good opportunities in animation that like 10 years later, that's still where they were. Um, and for me personally, it wasn't necessarily easy or intuitive to learn how to work creatively with other people. And I've kind of had to force myself to do it, but it's how I get better. And it's how I make things of lasting value. Um, yeah, so it's something to think about. So my point was that there are these things called comic shows and that people went to them and then they met people and they made work and they continued to make work and they stuck with it. And then they worked on cartoons and the cartoons they made were good. And I hope that gives you some ideas and I hope that sparks your interest. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I, I haven't looked at the chat at all, but yeah, we have a few minutes left at least, right? Yeah, thank you so much, John, for your presentation. It was really inspiring, at least to me personally. And I know everyone in the chat was really excited to see um, some of their favorite um, creators um, included. Awesome. So um, if anyone has any questions, you guys can either unmute yourselves or drop it in the chat um, in these last few minutes. Um, just letting you all know that we're going to end at um, 2.30. So ask your questions while you can. Or if you have any other, if you have like a comic that you want to promote to everyone else, then also feel free to do that too. I'd love to check out any of your work that you've done. So Jasper asks, do you have any projects that you're excited to work on or that you're planning? Oh, my own projects, like since lockdown, I've gotten much more into my meditation practice because I've just had more time to do it because I don't have to go to an office or socialize, let's be honest, socialize <laughs> every day. Um, so I'm writing, like I'm writing guided meditations and like working on this like whole, like, way that I want to present these like little publications and videos and written things for people. And some of that involves illustration and comics and some of it hasn't, but, um, but I don't know when things are going to open back up. So I'm just kind of working on it for me. And uh, yeah, does that, I hope that answers your question. And I, you know, I, I feel kind of bad not talking about mainstream comics at all, but I hope that it's, you can see that it's a parallel situation. Like you could go to C2E2 and pay $350 for a half table and meet people. And if your interest is more like X-Men or Marvel movies or whatever it is, like same idea, like, Go there, get better at it, meet people, read as much as you can on the subject and read as much work as you can. And it where it leaves you might be interesting, where it leads you will be somewhere you weren't before. You know? and, and music too, and theater. Like we didn't talk about voice acting at all, but all those voice actors on cartoons were in like some little theater somewhere doing something you never heard of for 15 people, you know? And they just did that and they did it and they kept getting better at it and they kept meeting creative people. And, you know, now they're Bojack Horseman or whoever. Um, somebody in the chat likes horror. Body horror is like a really popular uh, genre of comics, definitely. And I think that it'll be cool to see if that's ever something that an animation show like focuses on. I think the potential is like definitely there. 
I'm also seeing in the chat somebody just like liked the dramatic reveal of the room. Oh, Casey has another question. I have a question. When making a comic, does it have to be original? Let's say I have a character based of the character of the Sonic game, but it's a parody of the original. Can it still be original? Absolutely. When it's Reach of King, Rebecca Sugar, so much of it was fan art. Like 90% of it was fan art. It was, you know, I think there were more pictures of the Steven Universe characters dressed up like Sailor Moon than there were of like them as themselves. Um, and copying something is, is copying something in your own way. I have to be careful how I say this. When you copy something and you're at like, you're just beginning and starting out, you're, you're making something different. Like <laughs> you're making something new. So, or, and I mean, there's nothing wrong with fan art either. I mean, there's copyright issues that are shady, but like copyright law hasn't caught up to the internet even close. So, I mean, the better question for you is like, how can I make it the most ambitious Sonic, I don't know which character, it is but how can i make it a comment uh something about sonic that speaks to my lived experience and like my life and like what i actually deal with and how i feel um because people are going to want to read that and read more of it and be excited and it'll probably be more uh gratifying for you to do that so i mean think about that but yeah don't, I'm, i wouldn't sweat it i wouldn't sweat the little details of that Hopefully it'll be so successful that if Sonic wants to sue you, like you'll be like, come on, here's your mom. And then in this um, last minute or two, um, uh, Miguel and Lauren kind of asked similar questions. Miguel asked um, how to get into animation or how to start getting into animation. And Lauren asked about any programs that you would recommend looking into to start animation. Well, I would, I would look at the job descriptions for animation first for both of those. I would think about like what you like to do, if it's more writing or drawing or realizing like someone else's vision or like, cause it's hundreds of different like segmented jobs, you know? So when I was researching this, I found this really cool, just like job descriptions of every animation job. I would look at that and then I would type it into YouTube and see what came up <laughs> because there are research, you know, th these are visual people who want to share their knowledge base. Like the person doing the backgrounds on any show that you like wants to tell you what that's like. And some animation site has interviewed them about what that's like. Um, that's what I would do. And also I would make comics just because like comics are cheap and easy and like so low cost and, and there is an audience and you can throw it on the internet for nothing and see if people like it. Um, and I mean, hopefully today I've, I've helped you see like connective tissue between the two fields. You know, if, if you looked at all the job descriptions and you were like, okay, storyboard artist is what I want to do then making a comic and learning visual storytelling and telling a story of your own in that way, like great way to start, right? Um, but yeah, I would just, what programs do I re recommend looking into? Like for college, like the ones I talked about, like SBA, CalArts, MassArt, the School of the Art Institute. Um, but there's a lot out there for free too. Yeah, and is then that, is that a good is that an answer? Okay. And then um, right now we're out of time, but if anyone has any other um, questions for John, I'm sure um, he'd be willing to like drop his email or contact message in the chat, um, so you could ask any questions um, after. Yeah. I'd be um, happy to answer anyone's questions. Here's my Gmail account. Here's my Instagram. Mm -hmm. 
my Instagram. I, I have a Twitter, but I don't like Twitter very much and I don't use it. But you're welcome to reach out to me however you want. And I, you know, I'm no genius and I don't know everything, but I'll answer to the best of my ability. <laughs> I know some things. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I really hope this is helpful. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming to this. Yeah, thank you so much for presenting. So thank you everyone for attending the Alternative Comics Festival Animations Creative Mind and let's all give a virtual round of applause for John.